Good. You ready for the word? Yes. Father, thank you for your presence here in this worship. And thank you to have a word for us this morning. And our hearts are open to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. I shared with you last week that I had were actually prepared three messages last Sunday. And I wasn't because I wasn't sure which one God wanted me to share. And then I shared the message. And so I was going to be um, not lazy, but... Um, but I was just going to share one of the other ones that I, that I worked on last week, this morning. And so I, I had it that all planned and I was doing some other things this week to, you know, for planning and, and things like that. And, but Friday morning, um, I, I woke up and as I drove to the hospital to visit Joanne and then drove to the office, I, I kept hearing the phrase in my heart, build the wall. Now, I admit that I had watched the news in the morning, and, and so I, I, I'd, I'd seen the news, and I saw the standoff, you know, between President Trump and Nancy Pelosi and, and, and about the wall funding, and then I was listening to a talk show on my way to, to the Bel Air, and, and so I, I heard it again. They were talking about it then, but I realized that the admonition to build the wall was more than just about politics, and uh, now, now, to be honest, I, I'll let you know, I'm in favor of the wall. I really feel like we need that. Uh, and I believe that the Democrats do too. But I just think the Democrats are too busy uh, just trying to be the opposition party right now. So, uh, you know, they voted for it in the past, but, but they don't want it now because the Republicans want it. You know, how, how those things go. But I, I do believe that we need to keep our borders secure but also believe that we can work on immigration and make it better. So, but, but I'm in favor of that. But I knew in my spirit that God was speaking to me more than just about politics. Now in the Bible, there's a mention many times, especially in the Old Testament, about walls. And, and walls were built around cities for protection against the enemies. And really the first mention of a particular city that I read as I was kind of studying that very quickly Friday afternoon, was uh, the city of Jericho. And Israel was moving across the Jordan and they were gonna try to conquer the city of Jericho, but Jericho had these massive walls around it and they were impenetrable. And so the only way that God was gonna be able to give that city to Israel was that the walls had to come down. And when the walls came down, then they were susceptible to the enemy coming in, their enemy coming in, which happened to be Israel. And Israel went and, and conquered that city. The wall was built around Jerusalem even before Jerusalem became under Israel's jurisdiction. When David became king, he wanted to conquer Jerusalem. And the only way that his army could get through was they, they went through the water shaft and, and got into the city. And then they were able to defeat the people inside and they took over the city and that became the capital of Israel. Jesus spoke in the Gospel of John about there being a wall around the sheepfold to protect the sheep and that people that climbed over the wall to gain access to the sheep were thieves. So even in New Testament times, there were mention of walls. And, and the main reference to building the wall that I'm speaking about is found in the book of Nehemiah. And so actually it began in the book of Ezra. If you recall, the walls of Jerusalem had been utterly destroyed by Babylon when they defeated the kingdom of Judah and took the Jews into captivity. So they came in, they, 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 they defeated Israel, they tore down the walls of Jerusalem, and then they led all of the people, except for a small remnant of people, they took all of the Jews into Babylon captivity. But later the Medo-Persian empire had conquered Babylon, and so all of the lands and all of the people that had been part of the Babylonian Empire now became part of the Medo-Persian Medo Empire. Then God moved upon the heart of a pagan king named Cyrus to reestablish Israel back in their home, which was really unheard of. And I just want to read to you from Ezra chapter 1, and I want you to listen to this. This is a pagan king, and this is what he decided to do. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up, the Lord stirred up in the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, 
all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Are you getting this? Yes. Here is a pagan king yes. hearing from God, and God is telling this pagan king to build God a house in Jerusalem. Yep. Right? So, who is, a, who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. Now he's saying, may his God be with him. So he's not saying, you know, I'm going to become a worshiper of God. I just know God, this God is God, and he's wanting them to go and build the house. And whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the father's houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests of the Levites with all whose spirits God had moved arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all of those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. So Cyrus sends the Jews home to repopulate and rebuild their homeland. And in reading these few verses, we can see that the main purpose was to, be, was to rebuild the temple. But later in Ezra, we can see an added purpose, which I believe was really part of the original plan. In chapter five, verse three, it says, at the same time, Tatanea, the, the governor of the region beyond the river, and Shethvar Bosnan, Bosnai, thank God for Mike and Jim, and you know, I thank God for that. Anyway, and their companions came to them and spoke thus to them, who has commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? So their purpose was to build the temple and finish the wall. And although the primary work was being done on the temple, there must have been some work being done on the wall for them to, to mention that. So both the rebuilding of the temple and the city walls was vital to Jerusalem, and both had to be done in order for there to be success. Now, obviously, the temple is the place of worship. It was reestablishing the presence of God in the midst of his people again. And a wall around the city would enable the reestablishment of Jerusalem as a major city and a, and a city of trade and making it a, a competition to the Samaritan cities that were there. But more importantly, the wall would serve as a means of protection and separation from their enemies. So we can really say this, that, that the temple lets God in and the walls keep the devil out. Right? Exactly. Can we understand that? Now, by the time we get to the book of Nehemiah, about 94 years later, they still have not rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And, and this puts them at a, at a disadvantage because all of these other surrounding states, especially Samaria, you know, they, they, uh, they were hostile toward them. And, and God chose Nehemiah to lead the Jews in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And it really broke Nehemiah's heart to, to know that the walls were torn down. And, and, and so he asked the king if he could go to Jerusalem and see if they could rebuild the walls. And the king agreed. In fact, the king provided everything that Nehemiah needed to get the job done. So it's interesting that a pagan king provided for the building of the temple and a pagan, another pagan king provided for the rebuilding of the walls. Isn't that interesting? Both of these were cases where the wealth of the wicked was laid up for the righteous. Yeah. And we can grab hold of those promises in our own life. And we can see that people that don't even believe in God can go out of their way to make sure that we are able to establish what God wants in our lives. Yeah. You know, so we can have faith for that, you know. And uh, so the Jews responded heartily to Nehemiah's leadership. They went to work promptly, but their efforts, this rebuilding of the wall, encountered some opposition from the governor of Samaria named Sanballat and his assistant Tobiah. 
And, and this is what I, I want us to focus on this morning. So I'm going to make a spiritual parallel to today. But before I do, I, I want to set something up. All right. So in Nehemiah chapter four, beginning in verse one, it says, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria. And he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So the physical wall was erected by the Jews under Nehemiah's leadership, and it's also intended to be an object lesson for us today. So we can receive from that. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 18, the Bible says, violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Right? I want us to keep that in mind. The Jews had a special privilege as the descendants of Jacob. They were God's people, but their security, their well-being depended on their relationship with God. Okay? God had brought them back from captivity and reestablished them in the land of the father, their fathers as he had promised. But for them to flourish in the land, they needed to have a genuine relationship with him because vi real victory was to be found within the walls of salvation. Yeah. God had always had a call upon the nation of Israel. He had always had a call upon them. He wanted them to prosper. He wanted them to do well, and he wanted them to impact the, 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 the nations around them. He wanted that through them that all of the other nations would be blessed. And they were blessed when they followed him, but when they didn't follow him, they opened themselves up to the enemy and the enemy would come in and, and, and work against them. And we saw this in the, and you know, one of my, I, I don't really like reading Judges. I, you know, I like Samson and I like uh, Gideon. I like the first part of it. But then when you get into the later chapters of, of Judges, it's just these horrible stories about how, you know, God would... Uh, the people would follow after God and they would prosper and then they would just, you know, they would just fall away from God and, and the enemies would just come in and start destroying them and then God would raise up a righteous person and he'd lead them back to victory and then that would last for as long as that guy was living or that woman was living and then when they died, they would go back to their old ways and they would lose again. And you would think that, you know, as well as the Jews kept track of history, that they would have got it sooner or later. If we serve God, we do well. If we don't, we're going to get in trouble. Yeah. But they never got it. And then even when they had kings and, and they would start, they'd have a good king, then they'd have a bad king. The, the, the kingdom would do well. A bad king would come in and they would do wickedness. Yeah. And finally, Israel and Judah went into captivity. And one of the things that's interesting is, is that, you know, uh, the demise of the kingdom of Israel typically had to do with pagan worship. Yeah. They would accept the, the worship of the gods of the people that would come in and, and they would fall to that. You know, but that captivity did something in their hearts and they, they said, you know, we will never again fall to pagan worship, you know, pagan God worship. And so they really established themselves in that area. They fell in a lot of different areas, but they were not going to worship uh, false gods anymore. So the temple was a place for worship, but they were in the midst of a pagan people. We have to remember that Babylon had carried most of the Jews into the Babylonian kingdom. So what was left, this remnant of Jews was not enough to occupy the land. And so the enemies would just come in and they would just begin to take over the land. So these Jews that were coming back to rebuild the temple were coming back not to this Jewish state, not to this group of Jewish people that were there, but they were trying to establish a kingdom in the middle of a, of a nation that had been overrun by the surrounding nations. Can we understand that? Yeah. All right. So they were trying to make a difference. So establishing a wall around Jerusalem was, was important in keeping or creating a separation between God's people 
and those that had been occupying the land. For us, the temple is the presence of God in the midst of us. And the walls are the presence of God around us that has been built up by our relationship with him. I love the way Zechariah says it in Zechariah chapter two, verse five. He says, then I myself will be a protective wall of fire around Jerusalem, says the Lord, and I will be the glory inside the city. So there's glory inside the city and God himself is the protective wall around us. I love that. Now these verses specifically refer to the ongoing work of salvation and involves the spiritual growth of us as believers. The, the purification, the edification process by which he, uh, every believer is set apart by God a, as a vessel for the service of, of God. We're being built up. And then it takes it a step further beyond just the individual Christian because the church itself has to be strong. The church in America has to be strong because we're under great attack. Right. The, the church is in the middle of a godless people. Not everybody was Christians in years past, but I just know since I was a kid, the whole dynamic of culture has changed. At least back then, if you didn't serve the Lord, at least you had a, a knowledge of the Bible. You had a knowledge of morality. You had a knowledge of what was right and wrong. And so the nation kind of carried that. But over the last few, uh, last decades, the walls of the church have come down and so now this church, this remnant, we are a remnant to those that truly want to follow God. We're a remnant in the middle of a godless nation, yeah, right. of a godless people. We've been overrun by that culture. The individual Christian is strong and the church is strong when it stays true to the word of God. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 1 says, in, this, in that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bul bulwarks. Jude chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we can really say that building a wall is really building ourselves up in our most holy faith. Right now, please understand when I'm talking about building a wall, I'm not talking about us building a wall around our hurts and our challenges. Right. And too often, you know, we as Christians do that. We don't allow healing to come in. We, we just build these walls around us. And then we're, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a healed, healthy, God fearing people that have a strong relationship with him. That's the walls that I'm talking about. Okay. So, so, so don't misunderstand me. So the walls around Jerusalem gave the Jews two main advantages. First was protection that it provided for the people of God from their enemies. Uh, accordingly, for Christians, the walls represents the spiritual protection God wants to be established in each believer's life. You know, in the New Testament, Paul refers to it as the armor of God. Just a couple of verses, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So just like the Jews, it's crucial for believers to each have a spiritual wall to defend themselves from the adversary, from the devil. He's trying to, he's trying to kill you. That's right. So we need that protection around us. But the second advantage the walls provided was that it enabled the Jews in Jerusalem to control their interaction with their enemies. Specifically, the presence of the wall meant that everyone had to enter and exit through the gates, which could be locked as needed. For example, you know, the, the Nehemiah ordered that the gates be closed on the Sabbath day because he didn't want the, the uh, pagan merchants come in and disturbing their celebration of the Sabbath, their honoring of the Sabbath. So they would close the gates to, to stop the distractions that, that it would cause so that they could faithfully worship God. So as believers, our interaction with the world around us is to be controlled by our relationship with God. And sometimes we just need to shut the world out yes. so that we can spend intimate time with our Savior. It's in the same way, you know, not every worldly thing, every style, every craze is to be allowed into the believer's life. You know, we have to be discerning. We have gates on our walls, which 
allows us to decide what we're going to embrace and what we're not going to embrace. So the walls that we build are not to keep us from going to the world to transform it with the love and the power of God, but the walls are to keep the world from infiltrating our hearts and minds. All right? Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Now, Scripture further makes it clear that if we fail to grow spiritually, if we fail to build up our spiritual wall, we are vulnerable to the attack. And this happens in two ways. First, it happens when we have no self-control in our life. Yeah. Right? Proverbs 25, 28. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Yeah. The Message Bible says it this way. A person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. Second, it happens when we allow culture to dictate, to dictate what our beliefs should be. In other words, we let culture set the moral compass of our belief system. That's what happens when we let our walls down. Colossians 2, 6 through 8 in the New Living Translation. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that comes from a human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. Can we get that? When we adopt the world's way of thinking, we lose our spiritual protection. It's like opening the door to the enemy to come in and destroy us. And a lot of the churches in America are weak today because they have compromised with culture. Now, so the Jews were uh, at the task of rebuilding the walls in Nehemiah 4, when the Jews' adversaries, Sanballat and Tobiah, I mentioned before, saw them begin their work, they mockingly challenged them with six questions that we can ask ourselves, all right? This is from the passage that I just read. They said, what are these feeble Jews doing? So our question could be, what can the weak do? Second, will they fortify themselves? So the second question could be, will the weak do the work? The third question or statement, will they offer sacrifices? So we could say number three, will, they, will the weak pay the price? Then they said, will they complete it in a day? The fourth question we could ask is, will the weak finish in time? They said, will they draw or revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? So we could ask, Will the weak build with what's left? And then they said, whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then the sixth question is, will the weak build well? So I believe that today we're faced with the same challenges from our adversary, the devil, as he tries to discourage and defeat our spiritual growth. So it's crucial for us that we're able to resist the devil's opposition and, and build the wall. So let's kind of look at these questions very quickly from a perspective of a believer. Number one, what can the weak do? And, and asking this question, Sam Ballot was pointing out that was already painfully obvious that the Jews were few in number that were there and they were, and their strength was failing because they had been working on the walls and working on walls, carrying blocks around and building walls is not easy work. It was draining them of their strength. They were growing weary in the work. And, and likewise, spiritual growth, our spiritual growth is huge. It's an overwhelming and impossible project for any believer to accomplish in his own strength. Maintaining and building the walls of a church is an unending task and like Sambalat, our adversary, the devil, is constantly reminding us, wanting us to think that we are weak. Right. In Ephesians 6, 12, we are told that we are not in a battle with, with humans like ourselves, but we're in a battle with supernatural power for forces of evil. So alone in our own strength, we're hopelessly overmatched, doomed to defeat. However, we are not alone. Amen. We have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us to grow. And, and as much as we yield ourselves to him, Christ Jesus lives in us. Yes. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. Therefore, because of Jesus, no believer is weak. Yes. 
We can overcome the devil. We can grow spiritually. We can build the wall. First John chapter four, verse four says, little children, you can be certain that you belong to God and have conquered them for the one who is living in you is far greater than the one yeah. who's in the world. Amen. Isn't that good news? Good. We always need to keep that in mind. Number two, will the weak do the work? And asking this question of the Jews, Sam Ballot was challenging their will. Again, like the Jews, the key factor for our spiritual growth is our will. Right. We know what needs to be done. We know God has empowered us to, to accomplish the task. The fundamental question is, will we do it? Right. For far too many of us, this first step is where we fall. For various reasons, we just don't have the willpower to follow through with something. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's like the battle of losing weight or, or breaking a habit. You know, we, we, we learn about how we need to be healthy and, and, and all those things. And so we want to be healthy. We want to lose weight. We want to do these things. And so we start out with good intentions, but the follow through is the challenge. Right. You know, they always say that the first month of the January is the, the busiest times at the, at the health centers. Yeah. You, can't, you go in there and you can't find a, any a, a, you know, tool or equipment to work with because everybody's there. But you wait till February, you wait till March, and it starts thinning out. Same with all of us. You know, we, we can lose some weight and, oh, we're feeling really good about ourselves. And then, you know, some of that weight that you first lose is just pretty simple. You just cut back on eating a little bit and you feel really good about yourself. And then you realize it's going to take more than that to go any further. Right. And so that's where willpower comes in. Will we follow through? Will we do it? Or, or, or are we going to just go back and slide back into our own ways? So our will must be involved, not just our want. And the reality is, is that we are in the middle of the spiritual battle and our, and the, our adversary, the devil, is trying to destroy us. 1 Peter 5 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We have to be vigilant because the enemy definitely is. Okay. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That, that, that lets me know there's a passion there. There's a, there's a will that's being involved there. 2 Peter 1, 3 Everything we could ever need for life and complete devotion to God has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. So God has supplied the Jews with all the resources they needed to build the walls. So the only question was, would they follow through? Would they finish it? And God has provided us everything that we need for life and godliness, for a strong walk with him. The question is, are we going to take the time to follow through and build that relationship with him? I was reading, a, I forget who it was. I think it was um, Muhammad Ali stated he, he uh, hated every minute of training. He hated every minute of training, but he did it because he had a goal in mind. Now, I'm hoping that you don't hate reading the word. You don't hate praying. You don't hate those things. But there are so many distractions that are pulling at us. Where the will comes in is deciding that we're going to spend some time in the word. We're going to spend some time in prayer instead of just kind of falling into all of the distractions that are around us. Okay. That's the will. And that means even getting rid of or not doing some good things. Right. I'm not just talking, I'm not talking about sin. I'm just talking about things that are fun. And, and I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying that there has to come a time where growing in the things of God becomes more important than just doing all of this other stuff. Right. Yeah, that's right. God has given us all these weapons that we need to win the battle. So will we use them? Will we take up the sword of the word and learn how to use it? Or we, will we just let it sit there, never learning the word, never learning the promises, never following through in that? Uh, will we use the shield of faith and defend ourselves when we, when we are under attack? Or will we rely on the things that we see in the natural? That just don't work. 
You know, so spiritual growth is a, is a deliberate act. It requires us to intentionally make the right decisions and do the right things consistently. We have to be consistent. Now, number three, will the weak pay the price? Now, I'm using that word weak because that's what the enemy wants to keep saying to you. So we know we're strong. And so the question is now, okay, we're going to use our will to grow stronger. Will the weak pay the price? Sam Ballot knew that the Jews would have to pay a personal price for rebuilding the walls. He was hoping them, hoping that when they realized how big the job was, they would give up. Right. When you think about it, there were sacrifices they were making because when they were building the wall, when they were doing that, they weren't able to do their jobs. Exactly. They weren't able, it was affecting their income, it was affecting their well-being in doing this. Right. So they were making a sacrifice to see that the wall was being built. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3 says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So our challenge is the same. Spiritual growth comes at a price. Learning God's word and how to use it takes time and effort. Developing a relationship with him means setting aside time to spend with him in prayer and meditation. Living by faith rather than sight is costly. It means valuing that the things that God values and God says are important rather than those things that the world and our flesh tell us that we can't live without. Right. You know, a pastor friend of mine said that the difference between a disciple and a believer is that disciples obey everything that Jesus said while believers choose what parts they're going to obey. So are we a believer? Do we believe in God? Or are we a disciple? So growing spiritually doesn't just happen with no effort. If we intend to grow, it's going to cost us. And we have to be willing to pray the price. Number four, will the weak finish in time? You know, the Jews had taken a, a long time to rebuild the temple and an and even longer time to start building the walls of Jerusalem. In the meantime, the cities around them were growing more prosperous, and, and especially Samaria. They were growing stronger, and they were able to exert uh, increasing influence over the economy of the area. So it was hurting them that way and, and taking the time. And to make matters worse, they were, they were being raided frequently by the Ammonites and the Arab tribes, which had weakened them even more. So Sanballat's question pointed to the reality that there was a limited time for them to build the wall or, or they would lose their chance to not only compete economically with the other cities in the region, but more importantly, without the wall, they were unable to stop their assimilation into the regional culture and likely they were gonna lose their identity. Because of the, everything, the intermingling that was going on, th there was a, there was a uh, need to get that wall done quick so that that separation could take place. John chapter 9 verse 4 says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work. So just like the Jews in Nehemiah's time, we have a finite time in which to start developing spiritually. While the church flounders in distractions, the influence in the world on our value system is increasing. So the church has to wake up and the church has to do something. You know, the, uh, the devil's kingdom is already established in the secular world in which we live. And it's made its way into the churches and our chance to resist its influence to allow God to establish his kingdom in our hearts. You know, we, we only have so much time to do that. Jesus told us in the Great Commission, he said that we are to disciple nations. Yeah. It wasn't just people. We are to disciple nations. And I really believe that the church is to be the prominent discipling influence in this nation. Yeah. Yeah. Are you with me in that? Yes. To the extent that we're not doing that, the enemy definitely is. Yeah, right. So if we continue to live our lives with broken down walls, easily attacked by the devil and easily influenced by worldly values, then eventually we will become too weak to build and too embedded in the world to understand why. Right. Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 12, verse 35. And Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. So the reality is that darkness is trying to overcome us. Therefore, we have to make progress before it does. Otherwise, if we wait too long, if we waste time, 
darkness will overtake us and we won't know which way to go. So don't waste time. Go after God now. Amen. Go after God now. Number five, will the weak deal with what's available? You know, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had earlier torn down the Jerusalem and its walls. And when the Jews started rebuilding the walls about 164 years later, they had to use leftover rubble from the time of Nebuchadnezzar's destruction. And their chief enemy, Sambalat, took pleasure in reminding him of that fact. And as he would discover, however, there is a lot that can be done with rubble. Right. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 19 says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So the devil, who is our adversary, takes pleasure in trying to remind us of our past, trying to remind us of all of our failures in the past, trying to make us think that we're nothing but rubble in the eyes of God, trying us to think that, that we can't do anything, that whatever we would do would, would not be good enough, that God doesn't even want to use us because of what we've done in our past. Right. He's wanting us to believe that we're rubbish and rubble. That's his main focus upon us. So the enemy tells us we're failures and worthless and we can't do anything for God. But God answers for us. Listen, God doesn't call you rubble. I love 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. It says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed by men, but chosen of God and precious you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You are chosen by God. You are precious. You are a life filled stone that God wants to use to build up his house. So don't ever let the enemy tell you you're rubbish. I don't care what you've done in the past. Amen. I don't care what, what failures. I don't care. It doesn't matter. God doesn't see you that way. Amen. You are not rubble. You are not rubbish. Right. You are chosen by God and precious. Amen. That's right. Number six, finally. Will the weak build well? It's interesting that it wasn't Sanballat that said this, but it was Tobiah who cast the last seed of doubt. He declares that whatever the Jews would build would be easily destroyed. And I, I really believe that Satan tries to tell us the same thing. Look, don't, don't waste your time building something. It's gonna be weak and flimsy. But when we build up our spiritual walls, those walls will be strong because God is the architect and the builder of it. But it's interesting that Tobiah was the one that challenged the Jews because Tobiah had built an alliance. When you read through the book of Nehemiah, he had built an alliance with some of the corrupt leaders of, of Israel. Right. They had even allowed him into the temple where Gentiles were not allowed to be. So in this case, the problem was never the strength of the wall that would be built. The problem was who would be allowed through the gates. Right. We need to catch this last one. If we are growing in Christ, the increase in spiritual development is never the problem. The problem lies with our interaction with the world around us. Often as we are, are growing, we allow the enemy to slip within our gates, to sneak under our guard, and this will cause our, our downfall. You know, I was telling you before that, that Nehemiah shut the gates because on the Sabbath because he didn't want the Gentiles coming in and trying to disrupt uh, the worship of God. So. We have to guard our gates so that the enemy does not get in and undermine us so that we fall into sin. Jesus put it this way in Mark chapter 14. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So we have to be mindful and alert as to what we allow into our hearts because those things will affect our spiritual growth. Right. Yeah. If God is the architect of our spiritual growth, it will be perfect, complete, and secure. Yeah. But even as we grow, we need to guard our eye, mm -hmm. 
guard our hearts, build strong walls to keep the enemy out. What was it Job said? I will let, let no wicked thing come before my eyes. Watch, be careful what you watch, be careful what you listen to, be careful what you allow into your heart, because once you allow it into your heart, it can take root there, and then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak, all right? So build strong walls to keep the enemy out. You govern the gate right. of your walls. You govern it. God expects us to grow spiritually and build the wall. Ephesians 4.14, I love this, the Passion Translation. And then our immaturity will end, and we will not be easily shaken by trouble, nor led astray by novel teachings or by the false doctrines of deceivers who teach clever lies. But instead, we will remain strong and always sincere in our love as we express the truth. Amen. So despite the damage sin does to us spiritually and physically, the blood of Jesus Christ washes us clean and makes us new. And from human eyes, it may not look like much, but from God's eyes, it's a lot. Yes. And we need to allow him we need to press into him. We need just to build these walls around us, build the walls of the church around us so that, you know, we, we have access. We can go out and we can, uh, we can transform the world around us. But inside, we want to experience God's fullness to the yeah, max so that we're strong. God is ready to use us to impact our world so that we that desperately needs him. So build the wall. Build the wall. That's the word of God for us. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. So this is kind of a foundational message for the beginning of the year. And I just encourage us, let's really be disciplined this year in depressing into the things of God. Make sure you carve out some time each day. And I say carve out because it's, it's something that's going to take effort. But you carve out some time each day to spend with the Lord, to spend in the Word. I'm not talking about hours and hours. I'm just talking about start with 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And when you do that, you're going to decide, you're finally going to realize that that's not enough. Mm -hmm. And you'll spend some more time with Him. And the more time you spend with God, the greater you see how, how good He is and how great He is. And the more you're going to be able to experience that in your own life. And you're going to experience his great love for you. And you're going to experience his call upon your life. Those things that he's placed inside of you, he's going to call out of you. And then you're going to be able to use them to, to minister, to help people around you. Give yourself to God in a new and fresh way this year. Don't allow this year to go by just like every other year and start strong and then weak. I mean, start and then just build as the year progresses. Right? You can do it. God wants you to do it. He wants, he wants to spend time with you more than you want to spend time with him. Amen. So That's just right. give in and let him enjoy you. Yes. And then when you do, you're going to enjoy him to the max. <laughs> and you're going to have joy, yes, unspeakable, yes, yes, yes. full of glory. Yes. Amen. Yes. So Father, we just come to you this morning. We just thank you that you are encouraging us, Lord. That, that the temple is to be built because that's where your presence is. So we build you a place in our hearts. But walls are to be built around us, God, so that we can, uh, we, we can keep separate in that sense from the enemy, Lord. So I just pray that you help us to, 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 to press into you more this year, God. I, I pray, Lord, that I, I know it, it starts with us and it's, it's, a, it's a will thing in our life. But God, I just pray that you will just show each person in here this morning how much you desire this relationship with them. And so that what we're doing is we're not doing this job, but we're responding to your heart Amen. and your desire for us. Yes, Jesus. And as we do that, God, it's just going to be such a good experience of enjoying your presence. So I thank you for this, Lord. As we build the wall, I thank you, God, that you're the architect and you're going to help us to accomplish it so that we can be effective in reaching the world around us in the, in the truth and in the purity of who you are and the fullness of who you are in us. 
In Jesus' name. If you agree, we say? Amen. 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 All right. We've got some ministries, so we're dismissed.